what this is all about is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the parties. Welcome to Speaking Freely, a conversation about free expression in the arts. I'm Ken Paulson. It's called You're in Town the Musical, a remarkable Broadway show that's both irreverent and refreshing. Today we welcome three of the creative forces behind the show, author Greg Kotis, composer Mark Holman, and Tony Award winning actor John Cullum. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. The first question has to go to the author, You're in Town the Musical. What were you thinking? <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, it, this was an idea that came to me when I was out of money in Paris. I was backpacking for a couple of weeks, and it's one of these these sort of inspirations that kind of smacks you in the face. Just walking down the street, and um, I had been sort of broke for a long time, and I had been spending, I'd been rationing out money to use the public bathrooms there, and I was on my way to one, or sort of debating whether or not I was going to use it or not because the the money was so precious to me. And just the idea sort of came full, full blown, uh, and I just had to stand there in the street for a while, sort of thinking out the whole thing, and realized, oh yes, okay, now, now this is something that I have to write. And for those who have not seen the show, can you tell us you're in town in 25 words or less? Sure, it is. <clears throat> it's a musical. It is a, a dark allegorical story that takes place in a city which is suffering and has been suffering um, from an, uh, a drought for 20 years. And in order to, to control consumption, water consumption, the government has outlawed uh, private toilets. Uh, so everyone has to use these public toilets. But the public toilets, in good capitalist uh, um, spirit, have been privatized. And they're all controlled by uh, one uh, evil capitalist, uh, played by John Cullum. <laughs> and so he keeps on jacking up the price. And um, the story begins at the outbreak of a rebellion against the grip that this corporation called Yerngun Company has over uh, the city. Let's show a clip that kind of captures the energy of, of this very vibrant show. Welcome to Urinta. <laughs> It's a, a, a novel concept, and at one point, you had to convince somebody to write the music for this thing, right. <laughs> and to collaborate with you. Do you remember the first conversation you had? I do. I think I went over to Greg's apartment on East 9th Street. We were both living in the East Village at that time, and he had a scenario for it, and a list of characters with these crazy names. And I just remember thinking that it was... a a great story in the spirit of Three Penny Opera and The Cradle Will Rock, and I just thought, oh, this is the kind of musical I've wanted to write for some time. And so it didn't take much convincing, actually. You may have found the only person on the planet yeah. who, <laughs> whose imagination you could fire <laughs> right. with that description. That is kind of amazing. <laughs> it didn't take much to convince you to do the musical like this. It took a lot to convince me. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. What was your first reaction when, when they pitched it to you? Well, they didn't pitch it to me. They, s they sent me the script. My, my agent sent it to me out in California, and, didn't, and he, wouldn't tell, he, said, he wouldn't tell me anything about it. He said, just read it. And my reaction was... Uh, Urinetown didn't put me off too much because I, you know, I figured, well, they'll change that if they feel like it. <laughs> but, but then when I got into the, into reading it, it was very off-putting because it, I, I, I didn't quite, I didn't get into this feeling of it very much, and a lot of things about it put me off, and uh, it, it wasn't, and I got very angry, really, and upset, and talking to myself, <laughs> my, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> My wife heard me talking to myself. She said, "What's wrong?" And she said, "I said, listen to this. Re this lyric. This is what they think is a great number for me. I said, a little bunny in the meadow is nibbling grass without a care." Blah, 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 blah. I went on through then, on, and I looked up for some kind of confirmation of her negative reaction to it. And she just had this funny look on her. She said, "That's funny." <laughs> I said, well, "I'm going to re reconsider this a little bit." And, and, and that performance is a, is a highlight of the evening. The audience um, goes in, goes insane. Uh, was there a point at which you said, well, you like the idea and you love the idea, but no one else cares for it. How, how difficult was this to get produced? Um, it was 
it, it was it was very difficult to get it produced in a in a traditional way, which is where you bring the material to a producing organization or developing organization, and say, please give us support and you know nurture this this project. Um, so w when the time came in, the, in our development process, when we had something to share with uh, producers, we you know we didn't we didn't. Uh, it, uh, there was no convincing to be done because nobody was really interested. Um, but Mark and I also come from a uh, this off-off Broadway world, which is a very um, do-it-yourself aesthetic. So in the end, that's something that uh, we were able ultimately to turn to, just to, you know, get get gather a cast together and just put it up um, at, at the New York International Fringe Festival, which is where it first premiered. And the reaction of the early audiences was it was positive. It was, you know, and it was, at each step it was a big surprise for us because, you know, from the beginning, you know, we were, we were going to write this, but, you know, it, we were doing it with half of a mind of like, this is, it's a pretty funny thing that we're doing, isn't it? And, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it's a, it was a, I don't know, I don't want to say it was a form of procrastination, but it was just, we didn't really create it with any specific expectations of where it would go. Um, and uh, the more time we spent on it, the more committed we got became and um, always anticipating that we would sort of be the cane would come out and we'd be dragged off um, but it didn't show up so um. John you've had a remarkable career in, in theater and uh, and this is certainly not your first musical you've won two Tonys uh, I guess based on reading what you have been in I suppose 1776 was another offbeat musical for its time mm -hmm. um, is this the strangest thing you've ever performed in well, uh, in a word, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, it, but the material uh, when you from the written page uh, uh, is 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 can be off-putting. When I'm reading it, when I read it the first time, I thought, "This is ridiculous. I don't even like these. Little, these are juvenile, r rhyming kind of things," and it and then it ends up in some kind of ridiculous thing. And then I got very upset by the by the whole thing with the Patty. I, I said, to my, "They've taken a done a takeoff on Patty Her the Patty Hearst. It's just in worst the worst taste." I said, <laughs> and listen to the name of this thing, "Snuff the Girl." I said, "That just that's awful." <laughs> and yet, when it's performed, you find yourself sucked in, and 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 you're you're enthralled, and you don't quite understand what's happened to you. And it's only until when it's over with, or I don't know when it happens, or if it does happen. Maybe it's not any good at all. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't happen some level, but it does to me. Well, I think I've been I've been moved in some way that I don't quite understand. I think Mark may have said in an earlier interview talking about the experience of hearing um, a new and more experienced cast sing the material uh, that it was kind of transforming as the show evolved. To what extent do you recognize what you've written when it's in the hands of? of experienced professionals who then feel free to do some of what they want with it. Oh, the the cast brings so much to this to this material. I mean, we discovered it together. You know, we, we I think we we came to new heights. Um, uh, and I mean, particularly in in John's role where it's an actor of of such experience and uh, you know, a, 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 such a celebrated career to come to this role and to, and to bring that ability um, and just presence just by the uh, you know just walking on stage to to fill our villain um, uh, uh, full of everything that he needs to have that's a wonderful thrill to, to, to see that um, that idea realized in such a way is you know it's a, it's 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 be, it's be, it was beyond our dreams I imagine um, John signing on also meant to people who were put off by the title perhaps it can't be that tacky if if an actor of this quality is in it, or or he's more tacky than we dreamed. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure which direction well, he's coming with. Something both, probably. <laughs> what does it say about Broadway today that this show has received such a positive reaction? Uh, not at the same level, but Bat Boy has been positively reviewed off Broadway and has had a good reaction. The producers is a little different kind of musical. Are things changing? Well, I, it, I just know from having moved to New York in 93 and having made it one of my purposes here to actually go to a lot of Broadway musicals just to learn whatever I could, that we seem to have, uh, 
I, I don't know how to say this without insulting a lot of people, but it, it, there wasn't much inspiration for me, at least, in going to a lot of what was being presented on Broadway. I think we had come to some sort of point where we were sort of treading water, I think. And to the extent that this show is a reaction and maybe a kind of new birth um, as a reaction toward uh, mega musicals, British musicals, uh, that, that's my take on it, that we're just, we're, we're, I mean, I think we wrote the show trying to go back to the basics of the good old fashioned musical comedies, and that's part of what gives the show its heart, I think, is that we're just, we're just giving the, lo the love duet where it's expected, and we're writing hummable melodies and things like that. So I, I, I just think that there was maybe not so much of that in the 90s, and um, where people are starting to realize that that's what audiences like. John, you've got a little longer view. What do you see the evolution of musicals? Well, I, uh, it's interesting to me what Mark has said, you know, because that, that's what I'm saying. That's what grabs me, is that, it, that he, he's taking advantage of the, old, of, the, of the wonderful qualities of old musicals, the things that got me excited. And, uh, but you see, I don't think that Mark, or I don't think that Greg, can write without saying what they really think, what they really feel. And it's interesting because I don't think there are, they're that overt about what they want to say. It's very hard when you talk, when I talk to them, I'm not quite sure where they're coming from, you know? <laughs> but uh, but, I, but I, I'm, I know that I'm, uh, that uh, in the musical, that there's more there than what I'm seeing. It's kind of like, They've taken this this form, and they they're right as if they're writing it like the old people, but in a sense, it's not the same because they're like the young kid who also wants to go to the big parade and see the king and queen march down the street, <laughs> and everybody's saying how wonderful they all look, and they finally say, "But he ain't got no clothes on," <laughs> and that comes out in in the way in which they've done it. They can't help themselves. I believe that's true. I'm not sure. You also, are. there's there's a um, you know th there's a world of theater and art in general which is largely invisible to larger audiences, which is also where we come from from um, this uh, off off loop scene in Chicago and in New York off of Broadway. And the aesthetic which, which we wrote this show very much belongs in that world. And what you're in town is, among other things, it's a marriage of a new sensibility which is sort of in the, on the fringes um, and uh, a traditional uh, uh, cast and producing organization and, and director who um, have been able to embrace it and to give it full expression. So it's, a, it's this this wonderful experiment and hybrid, um, which has somehow uh, been able to survive. And, and the response, I think, has to do with audiences recognizing that, both that freshness the, and the daring, um, less so from Mark and I, but from you know John and, and the rest of the cast and the director and the producers who, are, who said to themselves, they must have said, we have no idea how people are going to respond to this, but let's see. So. I think that there's a lot of goodwill towards uh, the challenge they set up for themselves. You've gotten a lot of very positive press, uh, an occasional negative piece. Does the ugliest thing ever said about the show stick in your mind by any chance you want to share? Anything wounding about the reviews today? Not yet. Not yet, because, because it's, um, you know, uh, it's a question of sensibility. You know, I think we have full confidence in the strength of this, of, of the material, of the cast, of the performances, of the direction. All those elements, I think, are in place, and that we're very proud of that. And the biggest complaints that we get come from people who are on the opposite side of the sensibility divide, who say, um, uh, this has no, you know, throw that bum out of the house. Yeah. Um, but we like that bum, so, uh, and, you know. The strange thing about the show is it has for a show named You're in Town, it has almost no toilet humor, per se. I mean, yeah. it's, it is actually a PG-rated show. Mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't be uncomfortable with your son or daughter sitting next to you. Uh, you don't expect that. It is interesting to me that, uh, that 
that they've kind of covered themselves a little bit because uh, uh, the, the worst criticism of, of the play comes from the characters in the play. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> that's the, true. You know, yeah. A little side. It's a, what a <laughs> final line is. That's, a, that's that awful title. Yeah. It's right sure. at the end of the play. It's very, it's very self referential in the audience. So you can't hardly, it you know, it's kind of hard to criticize people when you've already <laughs> criticized yourself. So that's much. right. In, uh, in one of the many positive reviews, uh, there was an observation about the two of you saying that you belonged to the generation that can't buy into sappy Disney products. Is that true? Any sappy no. Disney products you were particularly fond of? Or? Oh, well, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Watch that. Well, yes, yes. I mean, I think I grew up watching the Disney musicals, Mary Poppins, uh, uh, Song of the South. I bought into all of that stuff. And I, I think it's that and MGM musicals, I think, are part of why I'm writing musicals today, actually. So for my end, I, I can't, I really can't let go of that stuff. I believe it. Can, can you make a Mary Poppins today, though? I mean, it's South Park the musical, not Mary Poppins today. Yeah. Oh, no, that's right. Um, yeah. I, and I think people probably still are writing the Mary Poppins musicals, but I think it's maybe useful f if you're trying to learn how to write them to look at those shows. That's certainly how I learned. In, in, but in, in, in a larger sense, um, the people, the people, the, the, the community that this show sort of emerged from, for the most part, are artists, theater artists, who, um, uh, I guess, re not that they reject musical theater, um, but, but there's a rejection of the larger culture of huge corporations which are telling you what to buy and what to think and what to say. Um, and theater is one of the mediums where you can speak to an audience, um, but you can speak as, without any of those uh, restrictions. And so, um, not that this is uh, a show which is sort of sneering at those um, values overtly, but it was born of an independence from them. And so we said whatever we wanted to say and said it how we wanted to say it um, because we had no uh, commercial restrictions. So to that extent, um, it does exist in opposition to the thing that you're describing. Although, at the same time, those are things that we love, you know. I mean, I, I love the old Disney. Um, you know, I have two children now, and we watch a lot of those old musicals, and they're fantastic, mm -hmm. you know, the old sensibility. And so um, even though this sort of emerges from a younger generation of uh, theater artists, it sort of re it rejects its own, the, 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 the commercial culture of our own time and embraces an older one where um, that kind of uh, freedom seemed clearer or at least the products that were coming out, the, the artistic products were, um, had more integrity. I'm curious, uh, this show is often about censorship. Um, in this case, uh, I suppose you probably didn't have any difficulty getting the name of the show advertised. Uh, uh, the vagina monologues, for example, had problems getting ads placed for a while, but I suspect they had paved the way for here in town. Yeah. Uh, but, but there's always the issue of self-censorship. and when the two of you would write, were there times when you'd go, you know what, we've just crossed the line. We're, we're not gonna, this is, this is something I, I don't think we need to inflict on the public. Uh, was there any of that? It was, you, you <laughs> I think, they're, yeah, I think they're, they're meaner than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to remember, because it was, you know, we, we've, been, it's, we've been with it for so long. Um, but you take a moment and say, you know, that's really tasteless. We, we're not gonna go there. But well, there's, yeah, there, there's a shared sensibility that we have which precludes, you know, uh, uh, what we consider to be vulgar or obscene or bad language um, or, uh, you know, sex or adult, you know, nudity or anything like that, like that. I don't know that we would know what to do with that and it always sort of makes us kind of embarrassed. Um, and so this, the, the, the material is an expression of that sensibility which is very orthodox in how it presents itself, um, and uh, I, that's a, I think that's a great advantage because yes, it is a show called Urine Town, but still, if you bring a, you know children have come to see this show, I brought my daughter to see this show. She's four, um, so she wouldn't understand it anyway. She liked it when people fell down. So that, that she laughed at that. <laughs> and there's um, a lot of that that goes. Out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She liked those, um, but it's it it universalizes it, and it doesn't um, it doesn't push cheap buttons. That's one thing that we were 
very strict with ourselves about. There's no cheapness. Um, you know, we just we we purged those those because we knew that the the idea of the show was so out there that um, we had to beat everybody to the punch. Um, both the characters putting the show down and sort of us removing elements that we thought, no, this isn't good enough. So, but that was an evolution in, in, the, in the writing process. Mark, you've held a variety of jobs. I was intrigued by, uh, you were the pianist for Second City, is that right? Oh, yes. I was for their touring company when I lived there in Chicago. So every yeah. night you're seeing some improvisation. Did any of that color what you do? Did you learn secrets working in Second City? Oh, well, it's, it's, I always found it educational just to work with great comedians and to, to, <laughs> to see how music hopefully would augment what they were doing. So that was, I mean, uh, yeah, somewhere in there that's helping out, I think. Yeah. What do you do when the comedy is improvised? What do you do as a musician? Oh, uh, it, just mainly to get out of their way. But if there's some chase scene, oh, this sounds like third grade or something, but <laughs> oh, no. If there was something that cried out for music, then that's what I'd do. And th but most of all, I think, or if someone was seducing someone else, then you'd play sexy music. If you see a punchline coming, do you anticipate it and try to do something about it? <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a drum set. I, you know, I'd give a rim shot if I had one. But, you know. Were you, uh, you had to be pleasantly surprised, uh, unless you had this planned all along, that you would get a uh, soundtrack out of this. That, Pressed as a CD. Oh, oh my! Did yeah. you guys? <laughs> did you plan a single as well when you put this <laughs> no. together? No. Uh, oh, the fact that we have a cast album on RCA Victor is just something that's totally amazing to me. I just can't believe that that's one of the many blessings of this whole process. Ta can you talk a little bit about about that process? Because do you bring all the actors, all the performers, into a studio then and try and replicate the energy of the show? I'd say so. I mean, we yeah. D uh, Economics dictate that we just have one long day in the yeah. studio. And it's hard. And I, I don't know that we always, like for instance, I'm not sure that I got it in one, I think uh, I got it in the, the, the bunny because I just knew it had to be jacked up. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the first one I did, I don't know that it, I don't know that it came off as well as it did. It's very tough to, to get the energy because this is a high, as you know, this, this show operates on, on energy. And, and, it, and all the performers are going at full gun. So uh, when you get in the studio, you have a tendency to be a little intimidated by the mic. I don't know how, how you felt about that, but I... Well, I just was... I, I thought it was remarkable that other veterans in the cast, like Jeff McCarthy and Daniel Marcus, were watching you do <laughs> Don't Be the Bunny. And they were... Uh, afterwards, they were saying to me, it's amazing. He understands that he's in front of a mic and that it's a different performance than when you're in a live theater and he's doing what he needs to do to convey that. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, you, you gotta do something to jack it up. <laughs> yeah. John, as this show is on the air in cities big and small over this country, there are people right now betting each other who you are, where they've seen you before. <laughs> <laughs> because for all your terrific success in theater, Television has been, has been uh, the way most people have, have come to know your work. Uh, Northern Exposure. Hauling the bartender. And ER. With that, with that good-looking young gal, Shelley. <laughs> and then you were on ER. <laughs> ER, it took me a year to die on that. I had, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> and, and how do you sort of reconcile that, that fame, that, that uh, you put all your heart and soul night after night into, into Broadway, and then I'm sure television is hard work, but the dividends it pays in terms of visibility are dramatically greater. Right. You know, it's uh, it's been a wonderful experience for me because it it came late in my career. You know, I, uh, and uh, I didn't have any, any kind of recognizability at all. But uh, neither did Julie Harris, mm -hmm. and she's won what six, seven Tonys. But uh, it's fun to be to, to have just the amount that I've got, so that people <laughs> recognize me as hauling. I I wouldn't want to, um, you know, to to have any more. I don't think than I than I have. I wouldn't want to get stopped on the street and that sort of thing. But it's uh, and, and it it make, it's fun for me because uh, I think it doesn't hurt for it doesn't hurt our show 
uh, that people say, oh, that's Holling the bartender, but, or that's uh, David Green's dad. It's been terrific to visit with you. I have one closing question. Uh, where will your in town go from here? Do you envision road companies? Will this be in every town in America before we're done? What's the future? Uh, they're talking about um, a tour. Um, I guess these next few months uh, is, is when those things are decided, when um, the people who produce uh, shows originating out of New York sort of, uh, I guess, buy them for their theater or so, so they're, they're working on that. And supposedly there's going to be a tour. There's a few cities. Um, and there's some overseas interests that they're um, uh, in the middle of negotiating. So, so yeah, the more the merrier. It's a question being asked all over America. Is this town ready for urine? <laughs> it's kind of a litmus test of what, what kind of community we yeah. have. It's been great to visit with you. Thank you so much Thank for being you, part of Speaking Thank you. Join us next time as we continue our discussion on free expression and the arts. For more information about Speaking Freely, visit our website at www.speakingfreely.org.